Hello, my friends. Steel Faith Overhaul has returned, and three legendary pirate lords have descended on the ancient temple city of Tlaqua, nestled deep in the deserts of the Southlands. Lord Mazda Mundi, Krutgar the Last Defender, and the Ever Queen herself have teamed up to prevent the geomantic web from failing and to stop Lokir Felhart, Araness's Salt Spite, and Luther of the Tribe Harkoni from making off with their lizard trinkets. Tlaqua is a custom siege map created by Zoidberg and the GCCM mod team, and it is a gorgeous one. The site of a battle where more than 7,000 troops are about to fight and die for access to the booty. A noble struggle indeed. And the sand-swept ruins themselves hold clues to what waits in the vaults of Chotek's Mountain Temple. There's a bit of a competition brewing for you guys at home. Scattered throughout the map are Lizardman glyphs of magical items, and if you can crack the code, you might just win some juicy DLC. Full details on the mod page in the description and pinned comment below. So, on to the battle itself. We got an epic 3v3 siege on the way for you all. Strap in, it's gonna be a wild one. We're playing with a newly released beta for Steel Faith Overhaul's Vampire Coast update, where Aranessa will be rocking her true Norskin heritage with some Northmen Reavers and a bunch of new pirate units at her beck and call. But this temple city is a tough nut to crack. Eternity Wardens, the elite of the elite temple guard, protect Lord Mazda Mundi with their gigantic HP pools and juggernaut resistance to knockdown, while providing the Slan with 50% missile resist. And the venerable Toad himself has some cool toys as well. Ancient Mind allows him to stop Rampage map-wide with a psychic leash, and Power of the Old Ones grants additional wins for every friendly lord and hero on the field. And Great Rumination is a one-time use ability that massively increases the wins of Magic Pool and Recharge Rate, but takes his melee defense down to zero and prevents him from moving, so he needs protection as he goes into a trance-like state and channels the winds. But once he wakes up, he can drop an ungodly firestorm on his enemies. And naturally, all these abilities alongside the already very impactful spells in SFO turn Slan into terrifying casters. So as we start the battle, let's take a look at Sarto's and Pirate Mercenaries. Armor-piercing pistols with 70 range, decent melee stats, they're basically mid-tier free company with Vanguard and Perfect Vigor. And over here, the Gallows Giant, the monstrous abomination from Bogenhofen, actually, or Bergenhofen, depending how you want to pronounce it. The Death Guard in the back, and Carronade with Grape Shot. Huge bonus for infantry of 20. They will shred blobs of infantry and give Sartosa a few more options from long range. Queen Bess, in all her glory, gonna be raining some ungodly hell upon the enemy, and shifting over, we'll take a look at Lokir Felhart's army. A lot of harpies here to harass the skinks and chameleons that might be nestled on the temple walls, and Lokir Felhart and his black dragon gonna be looking to close into melee soon, and establish a beachhead for the Dark Elves on the ramparts of a very defensible temple city. And the approach, all things considered, isn't gonna be exceptionally brutal for the attackers. Towers on this map don't seem to nuke stuff into oblivion like some of the other custom maps I've played, but once we're inside, things start getting pretty scary. Defense in depth, lots of big dinos, the horrifying spell output from Mazda Mundi and Choke Points, Sisters of Avalorn, and at the final plaza, Temple and Phoenix Guard holding the capture point. Legendary Pirates got their work cut out for them, that is for sure, but the prize waiting in the Monument of the Sun God might just make it all worth it. But yeah, to get back there, there's gonna be a lot of work they're gonna have to put in. Even Treekin, Munchasaurus, and like I said, a lot of dinos, all waiting on the wings, waiting to paint the town red as it were. So we're gonna go into melee right now, send the siege towers up, and do a lot of skirmishing, obviously, with the artillery. We've got a lot of ranged firepower, which is probably gonna be the biggest benefit for the attackers here. Queen Bess and the cannon crews are really gonna make their presence felt as they're able to take on the towers and the walls early on, just to allow us some more ability to get inside the city and start moving towards that final engagement. And first priority is gonna be those towers. You cannot let those keep shooting your siege towers on the way in. You cannot allow them to stand because if you leave your arty crews outside, those bolt throwers and whatever energy projectiles they're shooting, I mean, that can seriously rack up a lot of damage over the course of the battle. I remember in games like Attila, you would sometimes lose hundreds, if not thousands of men over the long course of a huge siege battle in a team battle, because those kind of things can just rack up the kills. So cannons will go for them, and the Dark Elves are gonna have a relatively unscathed approach. There are some bolt throwers firing their direction, but it's not gonna be too bad for them, honestly. Heavily armored bolt throwers aren't really gonna mess them up too bad. 
but the Fire Leech Bolas are definitely a nice pick in this kind of battle. I mean, handguns and any kind of gunpowder is definitely going to make them a little bit wary, and they are going to actually get in range of the Sartosan Pirate Mercenaries, who have that AP. They don't have a lot of range, though. Only 70 range, but they will open up now, do some damage early in the Fire Leech Bolas. The Pterodon Riders will escape. Drop some nice rocks, too. That's a really nice drop there over the entire top of that deckhand formation. But yeah, they're really good in this matchup because Vampire Coast, low armor on a lot of their infantry, all their deckhands, especially on the pirates too. And you're talking about choke points where they're going to get very blobbed up and those explosives can really rack up a ton of damage. Norskin Berserkers into the fight here. And those are more like pirate berserkers that kind of accompany Aranessa into battle. Pretty thematic, honestly. She is a Norskin mutant after all. And those skinks are going to have a real hard time stemming the tide of Berserkers onto the Ramparts. Saurus will trade more cost efficiently into them for sure, but Mortars are dropping on their head. So we'll see how that battle progresses as things go out on that side. But over here, Death Guard are in their element, carving through Dryads, and that is exactly where they want to be. Their regen's going to kick in. They can be brutal in a fight like that. And Dryads are certainly one of the more tanky, cheap infantry units in the game with that physical resistance but I don't think Death Guard are going to have any problems there whatsoever. But the support fire from below might be what turns the Sisters of Avalorn and those bolt throwers waiting on the wings. There could be a lot of problems coming their way soon with all that AP to deal with them. And of course the Dinos too, which are always really scary. Burning Head bouncing off the wall there and Sora Spears holding at the gate as the deckhands charge forward and things are about to get very scary for the defenders. Gallows Giant and a lot of big stuff coming their way. But a nice Tempest on top of Lokir Felhart and his Black Dragon hitting both and doing quite a lot of damage. And that's going to be a pretty nice way to start the game. Lokir already down to half HP. He does have that Helm of the Kraken, which gives him plus 10 melee defense and regeneration when he's in melee combat. But he's not really going to want him directly into melee, right? That's scary. There's a lot of Dinos. Krotgar on his Carnosaur Grimlock waiting too. But this is the Gallows Giant, and it is a beautiful behemoth that is the Torch of Bogenhofen, or again, Bergenhofen. I think I got made fun of quite a few times for saying Bergenhofen, but that's how they say it in Vermintide too, whether it's correct German or not. At the end of the day, they are speaking Reichspiel, which is not true German. It's just kind of based off of it. But yeah, the Gallows Giant going to set up near the gate and unleash a torrent of flame into the Sora Spears. And this unit has kind of been made fun of a lot. I think the Gallows Giant is honestly pretty useful in some matchups. And it's going to be useful here. I mean, it is SFO. Usually, when something is powerful in the base game, it'll kind of get turned up to 11 here. And kind of useless stuff gets made useful in SFO. And yeah, I mean, that missile damage of 8,000, it doesn't work like that in practice. But it can do a lot for you. Death Guard, like I said, going to get shredded by those Sisters of Avalorn. The AP quickly chunking them down and... They're gone now, crumbled into the ramparts up top. Krotgar himself and Grimlock, they're in their element right now. I mean, they did that for a thousand running years. They just ran through the jungles of Lustria without much care, killing demons as they went, killing a bunch of bleak swords. is not going to be hard for them. And with the Feral Carnosaur, we're backing them up. Terror route for the Dread Spears and Dark Elves on that side. Death stalks the land for the Druki. And here, Temple Guard and Saurus waiting in reserve. The Gallows Giant unleashing another Torrent of Flame into the center of their formation, doing some decent damage early on. Remember that everything in SFO has significantly higher HP pool, so even though range units do do more damage, do do, haha, nice comment of Cassandora, it does mean that the opening volleys won't necessarily be quite as impactful as you might see in vanilla. But as the battle wears on, that range firepower is definitely going to play a big role, and the Torch of Bergenhofen ripping through these Saurus lizard boys down here and actually getting some shots in from the solar engine as well as shield of the old ones goes down giving them 20 percent damage resistance it's gonna be something where you have to be very cognizant of where your gal giant or necrofax colossus is positioned because if he gets out of position Krotgar or all that artillery fire from the solar engine could really rack up quite a bit of damage on him and you do not want to lose that main monster this early on in the battle Common of Cassandora coming down again. And like I said, the spell output as Blade Wind goes down from the Supreme Sorceress, it's going to be scary. I mean, you think about vortexes and bombardment spells, all that stuff. They're going to be incredibly useful in a situation like this. 
And a storm of magic could very well be the deciding factor, but blood, sweat, and tears in the trenches will always have their place in total war. And this pocket of defenders are feeling the wrath of the Reaper Bolt Thrower artillery. The Eternity Wardens and Mazda Mundi making their way over maybe to relieve them of there's some of the pressure on that side with some spell output and Mazda Mundi is arguably the best caster in the game with all the changes that have been made in SFO to him. Uh, he can literally cast for days. He can drop easily four or five vortexes and bombardments and huge stuff throughout the course of a battle and he can probably even do more than that because he has bound spells as well. Gallows Giant moving its way over to the other side of the fight here under this causeway, the ley line that runs all the way to the Temple of Chotek in the back. Solar Engine now has a clear line of sight, but so does the Torch of Bergenhof, and it will unleash the flame and do some decent damage early on, but you really you want to be a little bit closer with that shot. You'll make sure that more of the explosive damage actually hits, and you can carve a path, and it's not just the ranged output. In melee, very scary. Bonus versus infantry, but the Queen Bass unleashing into the source, and that is a glorious sight to behold, and you might have seen there, doesn't work quite like it does in vanilla. When the Queen Bess actually lands in a unit, it will unleash a bunch of different uh, mini explosives that will do secondary damage, which is awesome. I mean, you can seriously eviscerate blobs there. Like these Kraxagors are doing in melee, they're not an easy unit to kill. They're a tough nut to crack for sure, and with their great weapons, they will carve a path to these Berserkers no problem whatsoever. They're getting debuffed right now, though, by both the Vampire Captain and Aaron Nassa, who's making her way over. And with that Bonus Force Large and the AoE from Kraken's Bane Spear, remember that she gives Bonus Force Large to all units in an AoE around her. She can probably help turn that engagement. On this side, Luther Harkin and the Dark Elves moving up, and looks like a Common of Cassandora coming down on the Depth Guard. Doing some damage there, a little bit less than I actually anticipated. It might have kind of missed, only hit the edge of their formation. And the Saurus charging it from behind. That's a beautiful fight from the Lizardmen. Well taken indeed. And the cold-blooded troops are going to get in there and start carving them up alongside the red-crested skinks. Croxagors, they're holding for now, but they've kind of been thrown to the wolves. And the Death Guard are in there, the Berserkers are in there, and Aranessa is in there. And she's giving that plus eight bonus for Slarge to all units around her and pole dancing. God, she was absolutely obscene early on. You might have seen that glitch where she could like one-shot lords. It was crazy. Thankfully, that got fixed relatively early on. In fact, actually before the DLC went live. Was a very good thing. Still though, she's a great anti-large lord. And on top of that stripper pole, she can definitely carve through stuff. No issue whatsoever. But you need to support her well. She's a bit too squishy to be a true world beater. She can't go against Krotgar or Kolek 1v1 and be expected to win. But if you give her some support, she can really make a huge impact on a battle for you. Morn Ghouls are a bit different in SFO. They actually have Unspottable now, which means they can get up right in the face of enemies. And it's only within like 15, 20 feet that you'll really start seeing them. So they can really get up in your grill in a hurry and mess your day up. And it gives, you, it gives them a little bit more utility than maybe they have in the base game. I remember in the Ever Chosen Invitational, I had a couple times where I would deploy Vanguard deploy behind someone and they'd get spotted from like 50 feet away, 100 feet away, and it was pretty annoying. Queen Bess unleashing again into the Azur Spearmen and trying to carve a path for the pirates to make their way down the left side of that causeway and make their way to the final plaza. But it's going to be such hard going. There are so many layers of this defense right here now. Kind of got to just peel them back one by one. Treekin holding there too. And the Queen Bass is really going to help in this kind of fight. Really going to open up that choke point. And oh my god, look at that damage, dude. That is so satisfying. So yeah, those Azure Spearmen are mostly gone now. Those secondary explosions really making their impact felt. And Krotgar kind of bouncing in and between all these pirates who will get some AP volleys going forward now. They can fire while moving forward. No Parthian shot for them, which is probably a good thing. But when they're moving forward, they can shoot and they will get some good pot shots into Krotgar who will beat feet out of there realizing, hey, maybe I don't want to get shot by a bunch of gunpowder units. Saurus holding the line. Those Depth Guard are actually about to crumble. I believe those were the ones that were hit by that Comet of Cassandora a few minutes ago. And on this side... The rest of the pirate units have moved up, and with their cutlasses and their flintlock pistols out, they're going to start skirmishing and kind of whittling down those units in the front, kind of shooting at the solar engine basildon, trying to bring that down because the damage output from that thing is scary. 
You really don't want that thing shooting at you for too long. Missile damage on that is very high. And the Depth Guard with Halberd, actually, in a fight they kind of want to be in. Uh, typically speaking, you still want to have them supported by regular infantry or Aranessa to give them even more bonus versus large. But they're going to do well there. And Lokir Felhart has plummeted to the earth, sniped by some Sisters of Avalorn. And that means the Kraken Lord is out of the fight. And that legendary pirate will not be getting any booty today, which is probably a good thing if you're Aranessa or Luther Harkin. You don't really want to be splitting the spoils at the end of it all. The more die, the better. Although Aranessa does have more living than dead now. So they actually have to kind of split the loot there because uh, zombie pirates maybe don't care too much if they get a lot of gold or glory. But uh, I think the regular living ones will. Soros holding for now. They're doing a good job of it with some nice armor piercing shots going into Krotgar and the Spirit of Zotal unleashing in the center of their formation and gonna knock around a bunch of them and a tail thwap sending them flying. Now the Gallus Giant will start shooting and there is a leadership penalty on that, but Krokgar has got, what, plus 100 leadership? It's the Spearfisher's net that will be much more impactful here. And as Aranessa does have the support of a lot of her pirates and those Death Guard Halberds, Krokgar in a very scary position, very tense one right there. And he's gonna need to try to run away as soon as that blue net disappears. Because with all those AP shots coming in, actually Gallus Giant probably doing more friendly fire damage than anything else. But yeah, he's actually gonna be okay. He did take some damage, but he's Krotgar. He is the last defender. You don't expect him to go down to one attack from the Spear Fisher's net, as good as Aranessa is at killing large lords. Luther Harkin moving up, taking some skirmish, and here we go. This is a new mechanic that will be coming in SFO, and it is... Oh, I lied. That's not it. That's the Pit of Shades. I don't want to spoil it yet. That might be coming soon. Sorry. <laughs> That's just the Pit of Shades in the center of the Sisters of Avalorn and Lothurn Seaguard. And the giant crab, the rotting leviathan in there and trying to anchor the line. Yeah, you guys are about to see something cool. I, I, I just think of it as a little tease to what's coming very soon. We got the rotting leviathan right now, the Alaskan king crab carving a path, but there's a bunch of carnosaurs nearby. Gonna have to be very cautious because this is not a fight he wants to take. And things shall get loud now. This is it. Aminar's Wrath, the fury of the now undead legendary Morwar made manifest in the form of an obscene vortex. It splits into six different ones, all arcing out and obliterating everything in their path. Incredibly powerful. Won't be usable in multiplayer in the final version of SFO when it comes out, whenever that is, maybe next week, but it is the final reward for killing Aminar in the Vampire Coast campaign in SFO. So it will be a campaign mechanic and a fitting reward for winning the final battle. And Lothurn Seaguard and Sisters will disappear in a cyclone of despair. I think it only ended up killing one and a half units. We purposely only used it once and we purposely only used it against a kind of unimportant unit there to showcase its power, but to not like completely win the game outright because we didn't want to use something that's completely OP and just like auto win because of it. But yeah, I mean, it literally deleted that Lothurn Seaguard from the game. It'll be a really fun campaign mechanic once you've won that final battle. And over on this side, Solar Engine has routed and Norsk and Berserkers and the Pirates now getting committed into melee. And yeah, that Vortex lasts for 60 seconds and it's got six separate ones that all split out, kind of like the uh, Frostworm one that's uh, from the Regiment of Renown version uh, that is in campaign. It's the Monster Hunt Norsk version. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's brutal. It's very brutal and uh, probably does even more damage than that one. So yeah, that was uh, pretty satisfying to watch. And so is Berserkers and Saurus going at it, blow for blow. And slowly but surely, we are shifting towards that final capture point. But the crab has been ganked, and Carnosaurs will be feasting on rotting Leviathan flesh because he has nowhere to go, nowhere to run. He is crumbling. And I mean, Krotgar is meant for this kind of fight. He is meant for hunting those high value large targets. And on Grimlock, he can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with pretty much anybody in SFO. And yeah, the crab's gonna go down easily. Not even a contest. And that's a big blow to the Vampire Coast attackers because the Dark Elves have already taken a huge amount of casualties. Very few left on their side. And here, even more Blake Swords going down to the Treekin. We're not the most offensive unit ever. They can certainly hold the line for a very long time and have no problem beating the crap out of little scrubs from Juki land. Yeah, they're gonna die pretty quick. Those uh, bleak swords are going to go down fast. And now 
it means that the Pirates are... Their attack's kind of getting stemmed a bit here. Their tide has been slowed down a bit. The Sisters of Avalorn fire in. But the Pirates of Sartosa are having a bit of a better time. And they are going to continue moving towards that position at the end. Near the entrance of the Temple City. Where the Temple Guard and the Saurus are getting ready to make their stand. But Queen Bess will soften them up. The artillery strike before the main rush. World War I style. Creeping barrage before rushing the trenches. And I must say, as awful, as horrible, as devastating as the Warhammer world is, there is no doubt in my mind I would rather go there than be forced to fight on the front lines during World War I. I cannot even imagine the horrors those people endured. Humanity sucks sometimes, man. It really does. May we never see a war like that again. Or any war for that matter, but especially one like World War I. It's absolutely brutal. What's brutal now are the Temple Guard and Depth Guard with Halberds fighting, and that'll go the Temple Guard's way without a question in my mind, and with the Sisters of Avalorn firing in as well. Nice shot from the Gallows Giant, though, arcing in from the flank. Inferno gonna roast up some of them Phoenix Guard, who do not have flame resistance, although you might expect that they would. They do not, or at least maybe, maybe, maybe they do in SFO, I'm not actually 100% sure, but they took some damage regardless, and the Gallows Giant has a lot of explosive damage too. But sisters, firing in, and suddenly, death from the flank, and heads will roll. Handguns, arcing into the side of their formation, and punishing them heavily. And those sisters, oh, they're not going to be long for this world. Some really pinpoint accurate volleys there. Very nicely done, and those sisters will have to retreat, or route, I'm not sure which. But the Temple Guard, holding... Berserkers fighting. Araness is in there too, but she's in a very precarious position and actually just forced her way through with those animations. And sometimes those animations can be a very bad thing as Windblast arcs in from the flank and shreds some of those Berserkers. And if you get through those Temple Guard as Kamina Cassandora rains down from above and destroys that blob of Berserkers. Beautiful cast from Mazda Mundi and the Lizardmen are holding super strong. You gotta be careful about some of those animations because they'll carry you through and against heavy mass infantry, you won't be able to pull back out. And then lords or heroes could come gank you. And look at that berserker. Beaten feet. He's like, no, I don't want to be here anymore. I'm out, son. And he's just sprinting Usain Bolt style down that causeway. And he'll be heading for the red line. And running off the map. But here, I mean, it's this is where things get incredibly tough. For both the attackers and the defenders. Because this is where the true power of magic can be brought to bear in these choke points. And Aranessa, well, actually, Luther, <laughs> disappearing with his fractured mind into the temple, disappearing, and he doesn't seem like he wants to come out. He's like, I'm just gonna hide here and chill with my regen for a bit. I like it. All right, now we're done. Terror guy's gonna take flight. Little bit, uh, little bit glitchy there, and Krotgar gonna explode in the center of the Sartosan formation, but Luther has free reign. He's got the aerial superiority. He can land wherever he wants. Meanwhile, a special weapon is being wheeled up. The Grape Shot Carronades with 800 missile damage on their opening extra powder volleys. And that means with that 20 bonus for infantry, they can carve through Temple Guard. They can carve through Skinks or anything they shoot at besides the big dinos. And that could turn the fight because they are going to have line of sight. Phoenix Guard Halberd's holding the line. And Alarial chasing after the Sorceress for the Dark Elves alongside her own mage and into the clutches of the black guard but she looks to run away because she can't fight black guard by herself that ain't gonna happen queen bess another explosion rocking the back of the temple and making sure that a bunch of lizard men do not get to meet their gods anytime soon because mazda mundi may be a god in the flesh but we won't be able to save him from that lightning arcing down will miss and gallows giant moving through the dark elves now and that Gallows Giant going to be very important in this final fight for the Plaza. But Mazda Mundi in that meditative state in the back. Remember, he can sit down on that bidet, go into a meditative state, go into that trance-like state, generate a ton of winds of magic for himself, and cast even more Vortexes as a huge Hand of the Gods impacts on the flank of the Gallows Giant and takes a huge chunk of health away to remember that it does have that weakness to fire damage and Krotgar on the hunt for killing the big monstrous timber machine the terminator or i guess it's more like a transformer uh tall gi style gundam style that seriously reminds me so much of mobile suit i love those shows so much i miss them so much nostalgia on toonami overwhelming right now but yeah the uh mazda mundi if he sits back there with great rumination he can keep casting for days and only problem with that with that spell is that it will 
mean that he is very susceptible to damage because he can't move during it and he lowers his melee defense to zero, which is pretty scary. That's why the Eternity Wardens are going to be protecting him. But Luther and the Carnosaurs over on the other side are fighting it out with a bunch of the infantry, trying their best to cause some kind of terror routes in. And it's time for the Temple Guard and the Eternity Warden to finally get committed to the fight as artillery rains down from above. We've got a final battle for the plaza and it's still totally up in the air. Mazda Mundi holding line for now and the Grape Shot are just about now wheeled into position. And this is where they can make their presence felt. Firing in from the flank, unleashing brutal anti-infantry shot into the sides of the Temple Guard and the Phoenix Guard and all the infantry that remain. Let's see what they can do. Saurus and Temple Guard feeling it from that Gallows Giant but he's below half HP now, and if Krotgar and the Carnosaur can get on top of him, he's gonna die. In fact, I think we just saw the Feral Carnosaur get netted by Aranessa and routed, but the Blaze of the Blood Queen and the Temple Guard fighting, and that's so cool. The elite infantry for both factions, and the Grape Shot firing him from the flank. Burning Head going down the center of the causeway. Mustard Moody does have that in SFO, and a couple more bound spells to boot, and yeah, and there's Feral Carnosaur is coming in from the flank, Grapeshot actually might be doing more friendly fire damage than it is killing Temple Guard right now, but that's more because the Blades of the Blood Queen were already so hurt. And they're routed. Temple Guard held very well, and still, the plaza holds. Still, the defenders are pushing the attackers back, and still, the battle is up in the air, and we're almost 30 minutes in. Luther Harkin coming in from the flank now. There's still a Black Dragon around, but very low and might route the second he tries to go into combat. And another big hand of the gods going to hit the Gallows Giant, bringing him very low. The Feral Carnosaur getting kinked up by the Vampire Captain, by the Gallows Giant, and by Aranessa. And he will plummet. And she can add a gigantic T-Rex to the list of notches on her Kraken's Bane. As the Spirit of Zolo rips through the center of the formation. And Ar Aranessa and Krotgar try to keep fighting. But the Gallows Giant is crumbling and might not be long for this world right now. Looks like the Carnosaur group really did a number on him, charging into Black Guard. Maybe not the best fight, but it might be enough as he starts attacking from the rear. Might be enough to turn it. But handgun fire arcing in from the flank, and those Temple Guard and Eternity Wardens are feeling it. Nice cast from the Shield of the Old Ones to increase that damage resistance. Luther is still in very good shape, though. One thing that we haven't really talked about so far, Vampire Captain for Sartosa has been using Invocation of the Heck on him. Which means he's back up to full HP now. And on Terrorgeist, that's a big threat for the lizard men, for sure. And we're into it now. This is where it's all gonna be decided. I can't tell if that, that might be a comment of Cassandora. It is. I cannot believe he still has spells at the end of all of that. Pirates and Black Guard punished super heavily there. Mustamundi has been raining those on high all game long, and he still has Winds of Magic left. Gallows Giant plunging into melee and he has unleashed his own summons remember that all hands on deck is a bounce spell that automatically unleashes whenever he drops below half hp and aranessa sprinting anime style into the teeth of the defense of the lizardmen alarial krotgar mazda mundi all surrounding her can she champion her way to victory can she naruto her way on top of Kraken's Bane and take down some lords and the Eternity Wardens at Temple Guard and surround their lord. She's not in a good spot right now. She does not have a lot of support, but the Necrofax Colossus is coming in with a huge hook hand, which is awesome. It's actually just a gigantic fish hook. Might be able to do stuff, but he's fighting large units and he's a bonus for infantry monster. Won't be able to tear around any of that stuff. And the Gallows Giant goes down. The Torch of Bergenhofen disappears, crumbles into oblivion, and... Though the bounce bar is in Sartosa's favor right now, there's not a lot left on either side. Blackguard holding on by a thread. Temple Guard holding on by a thread. Banishment ripping forward. Shield of the Old Ones going down. Mazda Mundi just unleashing everything like a shadow of Croak. Just doing whatever he can to keep the Lizardmen in this fight. That storm of magic that Venerable Lord Croak made so famous all those 8,000 years ago when the demons attacked. Doing what he can. Another deliverance of... Uh, not deliverance of pizza. Maybe we'll see that one day. Ruination of cities going forward. I don't know if that actually killed a whole lot there. But Luther, Aranessa, Krotgar all fighting. And let them fight. The kaiju and the monster killer going at it. Can Aranessa win this? 
Can Kraken's Bane bring down the Carnosaur? Grimlock and the last defender. That's gonna be really tough. He's popping some physical resistance right now. Alarial actually coming in from behind. Might try to gank up this duel. And Grimlock twerking, shaking that big Carnosaur booty. Really showing them who's boss. Tail Thrive's going down. Aranessa dies. Alarial, you dirty girl. You just came out of nowhere. Ruined the duel with an attack from the flank. I don't know if Aranessa could have won it, but that was a crazy fight. Alarial, how dare you, you betrayer. You deceitful trick. How dare you? And Krotgar, Mazda Mundi, Luther Harkin now. I think Luther Harkin and those two are the only... Oh, actually, Alarial's still alive. So yeah, four of the six legendary lords are actually still around here at the end of the game. Luther in very good shape in terms of his health though, and he just munched on a Larial. She went down, Vampire Captain fighting Krotgar, and he's just routed. That leaves Mazda Mundi. The Bolt Thrower crews are having to get committed to the fight now. The Grape Shot Cannon crews were run down by Skinks, but everything is routing. There's almost nothing left. Queen Vess making its presence felt one last time, thundering into the center of some of the routing Lizardmen. And as Krotgar shatters, as Sheila the Old Ones goes down, Mazda Mundi fights to the death, but it will not be enough. He will rout. Luther Harkin will be the last one standing and get the booty, get the lizard trinkets, and nope the hell on out of there. A crazy siege, a legendary siege. And remember, if you want to take part of that competition on the map, all you got to do is go to the Steam page. I'll be linked in the description and pinned comment below, and you can try to uncover what the the depths of those glyphs, I guess, and figure out what that stuff means. If you crack the code, might win some DLC. But it was a fun battle, man. Like, we got to see a bunch of cool stuff. We got to see the new Norskin units, the new Sartosan pirate units that'll be working alongside Aranessa. Gallows Giant with 166 kills, ain't bad. Lokir Felhart did what he could, 80-something kills, ain't terrible either. Black Dragon didn't do so hot, but, I mean, the Dark Elves had probably the hardest job because they had to go against Krotgar and the Carnosaurs early on, and that was a lot of terror routes as they charge into melee there. Luther Harkins and his Depth Guard. Huge impact on this game. This was definitely a game for Depth Guard. They traded very well into the Defenders, but I mean, think about what had to be committed there. And think about the Spellcasters, the Storm of Magic that was unleashed by all of them. The Dark Elf Sorceress, Mazda Mundi, Aranessa with her summoning of Aminar's Wrath. So many cool Vortexes that killed a lot, but at the end of the day, it was decided in the trenches. And that is where the Eternity Wardens, the Temple Guard, or the Depth Guard, or the Norskin Berserkers really did what they could. And it made for a very visceral, very brutal, very entertaining siege battle. So thank you to all the people who played. Tim, Dino, Festus, Command Post, Weston, Sammy. Really enjoyed it. Hope you guys did too. Peace out.